It's a great pleasure to welcome all 211 registered guests to my small one-bedroom apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Please all make yourselves at home. Um, before we go any further, that count of 211 has been independently verified, contains no dead people nor double counting. Claims that we're inflating attendance are just fake news. While I have to be non-political, I cannot convey to you the joy and relief at this second key November metric. Voting is also a vaccine. My name is Ray Ryan and I have the good fortune to be Peter's editor at CUP, a very easy task. And along with my colleagues, um, we'll keep a low profile so that the distinguished panel can discuss Peter's extraordinary book. And it is genuinely an extraordinary achievement. I finished reading the manuscript of it in a rundown cafe in the Mission in San Francisco. There are a few things in life one can say with absolute certainty, but one is, I think, this was the first time the CUP manuscript had been read in this cafe. Of course, many may think that this reflects well on the cafe, and I wouldn't dispute that perspective. As a publisher, uh, the panel will, will, uh, will talk about the content of the book, but as a publisher, it immediately seemed obvious to me that this book could become a foundational text for the study of the novel, a book to take its place alongside classic studies such as E. Watts' The Rise of the Novel. The prosthetic imagination showed many things, the forms of knowledge that the novel can produce, the novel's relationship to other political and cultural narratives, the novel's generic evolution, and it brought a vast range of texts into a dialogue that one had always suspected existed, but which was now set out, uh, which was now set out with flair and enviable critical authority. I emailed Peter and said, I knew you were a brainy lad, but this is top, top darts. His better half, Hannah, to whom the book is dedicated, asked, could we get top darts on the back of the book? Alas, Hannah, no. But we do have an exceptional panel. And before I introduce them, one more point. This book is one strand of Peter Boxall's contribution to the CUP list. He has written an introduction to 21st century fiction. He's a companion editor. He's author of a classic study, The Value of the Novel. And he's founding series editor of Cambridge Studies in 21st century literature and culture. Already, he has made that series an essential component of the CUP list. At a recent conference, it was described as having changed the landscape of 21st century literary studies. For all that, for the dedication, commitment and vision, and for the privilege of publishing the prosthetic imagination, he has our respect, our gratitude and our affection. The panel hardly needs an introduction, but let me briefly summarise them for you. In a short time, Cheryl Vint has made a big impact on the CUP list. She is editor of After the Human, editor of a forthcoming companion to American Utopian Lit, 1945 to 2020, and her book, Biopolitical Futures in 21st Century Speculative Fiction, will be published in Peter series in 2021. At the University of uh, California, Riverside, she directs science fiction and technocultural studies, edits two journals on science fiction studies, and is president of the International Association for the Fantastic in the Arts. Laura Marcus is Goldsmiths Professor of Oxford, a delegate of OUP, author of many books on 19th and 20th century literature and culture, including Life Riding, Modernism, Virginia Woolf and Bloomsbury, all published, he said, through Gritted Teeth elsewhere. But unquestionably, the book that she is most proud of is with her co-editor, Peter Nichols, The Cambridge History of 20th Century uh, Literature, plus her other CUP book, Dreams of Modernity, Psychoanalysis, Literature, Cinema. No matter how committed Laura is to other minor university presses, she always finds time to advise us and to help younger CUP authors too. Her presence here reflects that professional generosity and we're always very grateful for that. Ato Quayson is a permanent presence on the CUP list. We always seem to have something forthcoming from him. As journal, companion, Cambridge history editor, his mark is deep and wide. Now, Jean G and Morris M. Doyle, professor in inter interdisciplinary studies at Stanford, and recently made a fellow of the British Academy, his new book, Tragedy and Post-Colonial Literature, will be published in 2021. Atto will give the Isaiah Berlin Lectures at Wolfson College, Oxford, based on the book in the summer of 2021, and we're developing four other projects too. I just tried to keep up. I couldn't imagine doing my job without Atto as author and advisor. Anki Mukherjee is Professor of World Literature at Wadden College, Oxford. Her last book, What is a Classic, was winner of the British Academy 2015 Rose Mary Crawshay Prize. For CUP, she's edited after Lacan, and I'm genuinely delighted to say that we've just taken under contract in Peter's series, her new book, Unseen City, The Psychic Lives of the Urban Poor, a book as exciting and ambitious as the title indicates. It'll be published in 2021, 
If you want to know what a classic critical book of prodigious research, global reach, and exhilarating social commitment looks like, then honestly, don't miss this one. Nancy Armstrong is Gilbert, Lewis, and Edward Lehman, Distinguished Professor of English at Duke. Nancy has served as editor of the journal Novel, a forum on fiction since 1996. Her scholarship explains how novels imagine a world that can be inhabited or not in specific ways by historically and culturally variable readerships. Can novels imagine alternative social formations? Her most recent book is Novels in the Time of Democratic Writing. And from all that, you can see how much of a pleasure it is to have a critic of Nancy's standing here tonight. So enough of me, Cheryl. Thank you, Ray. Um, so the prosthetic imagination offers a provocative new way to understand the representational strategies in the novel as an ongoing dialectic between mimesis and prosthesis undertaken at what Peter calls the uncertain junction between the fictional and the real. And what I find most provocative is its sense of the interdependence of the real and the imagined throughout the novel's history, the recognition that reality is partially composed of the imagination and thus that the realms of realism and of the Gothic or the speculative are not as segregated as conventional literary histories would have us believe. The novel he suggests is a connective tissue between mind and matter, lived experience and discursive representation that is simultaneously stubbornly irreducible to language, even as it remains the task of language to describe or refer to rather than to invent the world. I'm intrigued that the book opens by thinking through the combined influences of Thomas Moore's Utopia and Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. Both point to fiction's significance, significant role in political critique, offering alternatives to the commonplace world, expressing desires for other selves and structures of governance and community, seeking to ameliorate or reverse the alienating entwined structures of capitalism and colonialism that have also been linked to the emergence of realism. So my work is on speculative texts that seek difference, not mimesis. Uh, and that is because it's precisely this gap between reality and possibility that enables their political charge. Peter suggests that recent fiction of the 20th and 21st centuries is shaped by a recognition that the mimetic apparatus of the novel, its capacity to penetrate into a subjective interiority while bringing that interiority into contact with shared external realities has become inoperable. And while this marks the end of a certain form of the novel, he argues that its expressive logic continues, rooted in a prosthetic element that sees something about the world that has exceeded the novel's own expressive capacities, has known something of how the world exists outside our picturing mechanisms. This capacity to connote without reducing to human wishes is an urgent function of the novel today, as we confront a world of polarized media bubbles, rising extremism, and openly authoritarian politics. The representational strategies of political punditry have profound material consequences from the degree to which the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic has been politicized by the American right to the ongoing attempt to force reality to conform to political fantasy that is playing out across the end of a presidency founded on alternative facts which has now entered an alternative reality space of its own second term. Conspiracy theories steeped in racist histories and inaccurate mythologies are central to white supremacist organizations across North America and Europe, offering up imaginative realities that often mobilize violent actions. So never has it been more important to have a theory of the novel that enables us to see its simultaneous dialectical interests in the truths that might be conveyed by fiction, and at the same time, in a form that necessarily registers what lies beyond human shaping. So I want to end by commenting briefly on Harry Kunzru's galvanizing novel Red Pill, which explicitly situates itself at this junction between reality and imagination. It follows an academic whose research theorizes the lyric as what he calls a textual technology for the organization of affective experience, a form he believes that rises above the weight of material existence to focus on the mind that considers and feels that instead of proceeding to action, remains alone with itself as inwardness. While on fellowship in Berlin, our protagonist is unable to focus on his research. Instead obsessing about climate change and his inability to protect his child, binge watching television that seems to contain coded references to counter enlightenment thinkers. He fixates on German romanticist Heinrich Weinkleist less for Kleist's writing 
than for the murder-suicide that ended his life, conceptualized here as an early iteration of toxic masculinity. And all of this takes place in the shadow of the building that hosted the Wanzi conference where the Nazi final solution was planned. The protagonist encounters a white supremacist who epitomizes the contemporary alt-right, not a jackbooted thug, but an urbane and elegant Hollywood producer who feels no shame at openly espousing racist views, something that shocks the protagonist. And this encounter is the red pill of the novel's title, which is an allusion to the film, The Matrix a pill that wakes one up from dreamlike ignorance to the recognition of painful truths. This phrase has been appropriated by the alt-right, but Kunzru shifts its meaning again. The protagonist awakens to the prevalence of alt-right alternative reality, a fantasy world in which socialist elites plan the great replacement of white populations with migrants. Its adherents anticipate the coming utopia after Armageddon, when social justice warriors in league with Satan have been vanquished and the pure Nordic race will reign supreme. Here's the nightmare side of reality infused with imagination, not the simulacral blurring of the postmodern novel, but imagination now prosthetically standing in for a vanquished shared reality. Yet Kunzra's novel functions as an antidote, and this is precisely because it insists that its readers see the sutures between inner worlds and external materiality, between its presumed liberal readers' capacity to recognize the rising dangers of authoritarianism all around them, and a retreat from these truths in more esoteric writing. To politically engage the world, we must see it clearly, and the novel as prosthetic imagination can convey simultaneously and critique this prosthetic reality. The protagonist has a breakdown, readily admitting that some of the memories he recounts may be interpolated. Yet he rejects a binary between imagination and memory, insists on a third category that falls between what he deems the indisputable or at least subjectively experienced facts and the cuckoo-like alien fabrications. This space sounds to me very like the novel form as Peter has theorized it, a necessary suture between interiority and exteriority, between lived experience and cultural representations through which we give meaning to that experience. <clears throat> Red Pill shows us that the fractures which disrupted the power of realism's mimesis were not merely a crisis in representation, but one in political belief. Rather than seeking to escape materiality and celebrate inwardness, Red Pill insists, our fiction must help us see this new materiality including, or perhaps especially, the parts that are mixed with fiction. Cuckoo-like alien fabrications they may be, yet their real power in shaping political futures cannot be dismissed. The novel concludes with the protagonist's recognition that, quote, the most precious part of me is at my individuality, my luxurious personhood, but the web of reciprocity in which I live my life, end quote. And this seems to me an ideal example of the novel form remaking itself once more into a 21st century form through which cultivating shared realities is among our most pressing needs. Thank you. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to contribute to this panel and to celebrate the publication of Peter's brilliant new book. And I'd initially intended in my brief comments to pull out one of its strands, the topic of technological mediation um, from the wonderful discussions of automata and of automatic or artificial life from the early chapters onwards but, and its relationship to the novel form, but realized I'd prefer to talk about the book in the round and so far as I can in these few minutes as, as a new history of the novel. Now, I recall an exchange with Peter during his writing of the book when I asked him if he was doing an Auerbach. This was a reference to the selection of books he'd taken with him for an intense period of writing in Paris. But of course, Auerbach's mimesis is more broadly a work with which the prosthetic imagination is in close dialogue. In the book, Peter reconceives in radical ways Auerbach's model of the mimetic urge, which for Auerbach lives on and in and through the dissolutions and fragmentations of the modernist method, as in Peter's words, the basis of a shared reality which survives the distorting grotesqueries of Nazism. In the final section of Mimesis, the brown stocking, you will recall, Auerbach offers his account of the transfer of confidence in Wolf and Proust, in which, quote, the great exterior turning points and blows of fate are granted less importance 
while quote, there is confidence that in any random fragment plucked from the course of a life at any time, the totality of its fate is contained and can be portrayed. The passage then turns with no break in the long paragraph to a discussion of critical method so that literary example and critical method become inseparable, in which Arbach states that it would have been impossible for him to write anything, quote, in the nature of a history of European realism. The material would have swamped me. His decision, driven by both necessity and choice, was, he writes, to let himself, quote, be guided by a few motifs which I have worked out gradually and without a specific purpose. For I'm convinced that these basic motifs in the history of the representation of reality, provided I have seen them correctly, must be demonstrable in any random realistic text. The random text is thus linked to the random moment or fragment, to the necessary selection in the portrayal of a life, and to the multiplicities of orders and interpretations which the modern writer seeks to grasp in the random moment. Randomness is thus presented as at once an unavoidable necessity and an entirely fitting procedure. For, after all, as Arbach perceives it, the random moment or the random text, in fact, turns out to contain the totality. Two decades earlier, Ian e. Forster, in his very much slimmer aspects of the novel, had offered his own pragmatic account of his method. He was not, he wrote, a scholar or a philosopher able to contemplate the river of time and hence to explore the novel in its chronological development, nor did he wish to refer literature back to some tendency. Better, he suggested, to imagine all the novelists writing their novels at once in a circular room, a space that his book then affords. Reading the prosthetic imagination, I kept coming back to the question of the relationships between literary instance and critical and <clears throat> historical method. For unlike Forster, Peter is fully prepared and able to contemplate the river of time. The issue of continuity and change is as important in his study as in Auerbach's, as is that of the choice of text to exemplify this history of the novel as artificial life. Peter's superb readings, which confound any spurious distinction between surface and depth, in the act of reading, open up in new and exceptionally illuminating ways some very familiar texts, among them Don Quixote, Robertson Crusoe, Emma, Middlemarch, Bleak House, The Bluest Eye. We could also extend the ways of reading to works which are not discussed in the book. I thought, for example, of the linen weaver Silas Marner's inward life, narrowing to the worship of his gold as his outer form changes too. His, quote, face and figure shrank and bent themselves into a constant mechanical relation to the objects of his life, so that he produced the same sort of impression as a handle or a crooked tube, which has no meaning standing apart, or of the narrative and ontological binding at the opening of Great Expectations. That was a memorable day to me, for it made great changes in me, but it is the same with any life. Imagine one selected day struck out of it and think how different its course would have been. Pause you who read this and think for a moment of the long chain of iron or gold, of thorns or flowers that would never have bound you, but for the formation of the first link on one memorable day. These examples flashed up for me in part, I think, because of their use of motifs, to borrow Arbach's phrase, weaving, binding, which make up the conceptual and textual fabric of the prosthetic imagination. The relationship between continuity and change, which shapes this history of the novel, is expressed throughout in the terms of connection and distance, likeness and difference, binding and unbinding, entwinement and untwining, and the oxymoron of gathered dispersal. These are also the terms, as Cheryl has suggested, in which Peter conceives the relationships between inner and outer, mind and matter, material and idea. The tense relation between thought and thing, which is said to govern representations in modernity, accords with a model of resistance that runs throughout the study. Resistance is a form of counter-historicizing, but also to be understood as a tense relation or a tensile strength in which there is neither settlement nor defeat.
The question of continuity and change becomes acute in the study's final chapters as it moves into discussion of the novel in the context of current eco-crisis and precarity. Responding to writings by, amongst others, Deepesh Chakravorty and Amitav Ghosh on, in Ghosh's words, the peculiar inadequacy of prose fiction to the critical demands of climate change, Peter is in accord with the view that we are in a new and unprecedented world space. But it is the argument of the book that, confronted with the requirement for transformed relationships between self and world, the human and the natural, the natural and the artificial, the material and the informatic. The novel form, prose fiction, retains its centrality as a guide for the very reason that, in Peter's words, it has always touched on the place where the artificial meets with the real, has always oriented us in relation to the world that comes to view when the edges of the chiseled sentence gives way to something beyond them, when the mechanics of likeness lead us to a different universe of thought. Uh, thank you all. Uh, apologies for um, not being able to uh, figure, sort out my, my webcam. Um, uh, one, um, one thing that I noticed on reading the prosthetic imagination, P Peter Boxall's very fine book, is how it uh, installs a mode of slow reading. It is such a rich book that you are obliged to read it slowly, to reread various sentences and propositions. And by this mode of rereading re and, and, and installed by the book, it also generates a whole range of ideas that uh, come out of the book but go in every which way. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major contribution and I'm actually looking forward to further uh, uh, venues for debating debating it. Uh, another thing that I noticed, or not, not another thing that I noticed, one thing that was always on my mind, uh, because partly because I'm a disability studies scholar, is how prosthesis, the, the word prosthesis, kept invoking in my mind uh, a veteran's prosthetic limb. You know, so veterans gone to war, they come back, and they have a lost limb. And so I didn't have an image of a, a sports, an Indian sports woman with a prosthetic limb on my desktop just to be keeping that physical material manifestation of prosthesis in view. However, as I, I, I was reading the uh, prosthetic imagination, I realized that Peter was... Uh, of course, he was focusing on um, uh, prosthesis, uh, especially with the early description of his visit to the face, uh, face plastic surgeon. But he was doing more than that. And this is what gave me the, the cue. Uh, there's a point where he says, the, pros pr 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 the prosthetic object represents the missing thing but is not the missing, missing thing itself. Uh, not only that, it is a move from mimesis and emulation to supersession and recreation. So the prosthetic limb, to back to my veteran's prosthetic limb, is both the thing itself, which is the lost leg or arm, but not the lost leg or arm. It is doing more than the lost leg or arm because it is creating a relationship to the world that is only partially dependent on the lost limb. Now, this, this idea is, this is how I understand the principle of prosthesis. The move from uh, material circumstances or conditions and objects to a supersession of those material um, uh, objects. And that relationship is also a relationship of creation because it is trying to uh, change the world in relation to uh, the prosthetic imagination. However, the other thing, and, and I'm riffing here, that's connected to, to me in reading the book is how the prosthetic imagination also has major implications for how we think about time. The relationship of prosthesis to time. Of course, my mesis already imp implies time, 
and it replies a relationship with the real, which is to say the art object is representing something that already exists. In other words, there's a relationship of uh, posterior and anterior in the uh, in the painting or, or the or the or the realist novel. Uh, prosthesis is, is different because it is also intervening in time, but in a completely different way than mimesis. It is intervening in a mode of supersession as opposed to mere emulation. And so I was thinking, what examples might we draw upon to illuminate um, this uh, relationship beyond uh, the several rich ones that Peter gives us in his book? And there are two, two, two that I want to dwell on very briefly. One is it's a scene in the movie Doctor Strange. And it's where they are running in New York and the, the Doctor Strange, uh, the Kumbhavas character is running. Uh, and uh, suddenly the villain does something and the scene, the city splits up and they begin falling because the buildings are all turning upside down in every which way. And now that's, that, that it's about a five minute, five to six minute uh, uh, scene. The spatial logics of the scene are entailed in three different imaginings of space and time. The first is that the city suddenly becomes almost mechanistic. They are held into the uh, machinic sense of space. And as they are drifting in and out and fighting, everything becomes angular, angular and square. It's almost like the city is a machine and they've been thrown into the entrails. But this machinic uh, space-time is different from a subsequent space-time that occurs shortly after this, and which is that uh, uh, space and time become like a kaleidoscope. It's like you're looking inside a kaleidoscope. And as you know, when you look into a kaleidoscope, what you see is uh, multi-geometric uh, vectors. And as you shake the kaleidoscope, the multi-geometric vectors change and also what you're looking at changes. Now, this, uh, these two principles, and there are other, several other principles of time in, in Dr. Strange, also imply an idea of prosthesis. This is how I'm understanding it, in the sense that space and time are in a way experiential, uh, not in a way, they are experiential, <laughs> But in the science fiction mode of Doctor Strange, they are experiential in an estranged manner. Now, of course, this is commonplace in all science fiction. But the difference between uh, Doctor Strange and, and other movies like Star Wars, Star Trek, the X-Men, and so on, is that these other ones uh, are invested in wrinkles in time but not wrinkles in space. And we're going to a whole discussion on mm. what's the difference between a wrinkle in space and a wrinkle in time. The wrinkle in space and time together means that the time that is uh, that they have to traverse is a time that is uh, supersessionary. It supersedes the time of mimesis or emulation, which you would find typically in the realist novel. Let me move on to another idea of uh, the prosthesis and time. And this time I'm, I'm looking at uh, uh, Tony Morrison's beloved. Uh, Peter, Peter uh, dwells uh, a long time on uh, Morrison's The Bluest Eye, but I, I want to focus on beloved for a moment. There's a, 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 a moment in the novel where Sethi is talking with her daughter and they're talking about time. And she says, uh, some things go on. This is Sethi to her daughter. Pass on. Some things just stay. I used to think it was my rememory, you know. Some things you forget. Other things you never do. But it's not. Places, places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone. But the place, the picture of it stays. And not just in my rememory, but out there in the world. What I remember it's a picture floating around there outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. Now, this fascinating is in a way it's a philosophy of time, 
also suggests that time does not flow like a river. And like in Ian Watts' uh, uh, the description that Laura just mentioned, time does not know, flow like a river, but it's actually granulated. And it is granulated in the slave's experience precisely because the moment of slavery leaks the negative and traumatic affect into the moment and breaks up the moment such that any other person might bump or can bump into that moment. Effectively, this is also an idea of uh, time as a module or a monad in, in the description of uh, Walter Benjamin, for example. So time is a monad and each monad encapsulates in it all the reality of the universe. But in the slave's experience, it's not a mere monad. It is a monad of suffering. The point that I see here that Morrison is trying to suggest is that uh, in the experience of suffering imposed upon the slave, the uh, time is prosthetic. It can separate itself. Time can segregate itself from the moment of its occurrence and exist in the real world. I think there's a beautiful uh, image of the prosthetic imagination as supplied by, 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 by Morrison. So that time is not something that you pass and transcend. It supersedes the moment of occurrence and exists at something that needs to be acknowledged and dealt with. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. I'll go next. <clears throat> Towards the end of 1819, less than two years before his death from tuberculosis, John Keats wrote a fragment poem called This Living Hand. Uh, it's very short, so I'll read it. This living hand, now warm and capable of earnest grasping, would, if it were cold, and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights, that thou would wish thine own heart dry of blood, so in my veins red life might stream again, and thou be conscious calmed. See, here it is, I hold it towards you. At first reading, the speaker seems to be imagining his death and asking for a blood and life transfusion in the eventuality from the reader so that he can live again. Critics such as Andrew Bennett, Brooke Hopkins have pointed out that there is also a threat to the reader here, forced to sacrifice their life so that the hand in front of them might become warm and capable of earnest grasping again. So the reader must be alive to read the words and bring the words to life and then promptly die to reanimate the speaker in the poem. Keats's This Living Hand is not simply about posthumous fame, as critics have said. I think it's also about being alive in a posthuman future after the last reader has died. With this undead hand in mind, I turn to the dead hand in Peter Boxall's prosthetic imagination. Historically, as he says, the hand belongs to the self. It embodies the poet's psychic connection to their reader, as we saw, bridging mind and body, present and future. The extended hand of fiction is the extended self, to quote Boxer. The prosthetization of this appendage enhances the connection, but also alienates, and I'm quoting you again, Peter, the junction between mind and material. Boxel gives several 19th century examples of this estrangement or deadening. Zola's Madame Racquin's paralyzed hand, Wollstonecraft's Mary and her disgust of her husband's hand, Emma's botched joining of hands in the eponymous Austen novel, or the violent hand seizing by Mr. Elton, Casabon's mummified hand and mind in Middlemarch, the dead letters and ruined sociality of Bleak House. In many of these instances, however, the dead or death-dealing hand, mortified, petrified, dehumanized, 
helps the novel renew its commitment to living bodies, to consanguinity, to community, and the common good. Lady Dedlock's small, ungloved flesh hand, to quote you, uh, Peter, restores circulation to the chancery world and the novel world of Bleak House. And it does so through the metonymy and the contagion, if you will, of touch. The fiction of Charles Dickens and George Eliot, Boxer states, is, and I'm quoting him here, driven by the urge to find ways of connecting a prosthetic, manufactured life world back to the organic forms that it seems to threaten. The pages of the prose narrative become the connective tissue between the embodied mind of the novel and its biomaterial and biopolitical relations in the world. Boxel ends this chapter, so, so this is chapter four, ends this chapter likening the dead hand to, quote, an unconscious compulsion surfacing in a dream. And it is the novel, he insinuates, which, in, which negotiates between living thought and dead material. This idea in particular reminded me of Freud's Project for a Scientific Psychology, where he uses the language of energetics to conceptualize the body in its pursuit of desire. The organism moves in pursuit of different goals, seeking discharge and finally the homeostasis of death, evaluating its actions through the counters of pleasure and unpleasure. The erotogenic body is the one which has resulted from normal and normative sexualization with the subject successfully cathected to and governed by the symbolic order. The hysterogenic body, on the other hand, is produced when the sexualization of the body cannot be historically determined and the subject has failed to be formulated by the symbolic order of sexual difference. The hysterogenic body, Freud says, works like a surrogate or counter effect to the erotogenic body. Like the, like the prosthesis, it has no body and it also has too much body. The stable, cohesive subject of Victorian realism is haunted by the bad body and disjunctive temporality of the Gothic. It's a, as Boxell says, mutually entwined relation. Realism is threatened by the Gothicism it precipitates, while the Gothic itself needs realism to claim its symbolic due. Literature's prosthetic imagination not only fashions a new relation between life and death, I'm quoting Peter Boxel here, in the diegetic world, but also, and this is my suggestion, in its positing of an interaction with the reader of such a text. It wants the reader to bring it to life, but warns that the terms of this engagement will be haunting, chilling, and the enthralled reader willing their own living heart dry of blood, as John Keats said. Thank you. Thank you. So Peter, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a, I'm, I'm happy to be here, everyone. Um, this is a book, I really, I think it's really terrific. I think it's a breakthrough book. And well, of course, Peter wouldn't have invited me unless he knew I thought, I felt that way about it. But um, I want to, I say that as a sort of preface because I'm going to boil it down pretty ruthlessly um, to three conceptual moves that Peter has woven into a luxurious tapestry of carefully chosen encounters between the novel's mimetic way of thinking and its prosthetic double. Their relationship organizes his revisionary history of the novel. So I'm going to, now I'm going to give you three moves. Boxall's first move is to challenge the mastery, the presumed mastery of enlightenment empiricism over the 18th century imagination which, as Locke himself demonstrates, was actually torn between two ways of understanding the geopolitical environment in which he had situated his model individual. 
according to the first of these two ways of thinking, and I, th I think they correspond to mimesis and prosthesis quite nicely, these two notions of material property and the potential or what Balibar calls constitutive property in the self. Um, according to the first way of thinking, the individual's acquisition of understanding the process by which he becomes an individual is based on information he receives through the five senses, then orders, uses his mind to order the faculties of reason into concepts, which are assembled as a model of the world outside himself. This establishes the sort of fundamental, the caesura, the difference between inside and an outside, that makes mimesis possible. It's got to have an inside and outside in order to have a mirror, a mirroring relationship. According to this second mode of thought, this is the aggressive, the restless, uh, what, what Locke calls uneasiness uh, in, in, in the mind that makes it move. According to the second mode of thought, thinking is entirely a function of faculties imminent in individual human beings who come into existence as such as they extend themselves into the world through encounters with particular things and people. And this mode of thinking, it bears, com it bears uh, comparison to uh, the, the mode that Deleuze describes in his essay on Spinoza's affect. According to the second mode of thought, let's see, that I said that, let's see. The drive to materialize, we're on the second mode of thought. The drive to materialize what it can imagine obviously animates Robinson Crusoe, what his mind can imagine obviously animates Robinson Crusoe the foes artisan, tradesman, entrepreneur, a figure whom Locke tucks away in his second treatise as a fiction of origins, or the man who mixes his labor with the world, an account of how the hereditary property owner first came by his property. Okay, that's, that's the first move is to to set up these two modes of, of thinking, which are which are offered two ways of um, the individual becoming who he is, or she. It was he back then. Please forgive my pronouns. Um, Boxall's second move is to show how these two ways of thinking assemble antagonistic models of the world that come to loggerheads in the great works of 19th century realism. Boxall indeed convinces me that novels become great works of realism, paradoxically, only as they grant the prosthetic imagination temporary dominance over a mode of narration that observes the mimetic mode. That is to say, it tells us what we would grasp through our five senses if we were in the narrative's, narrator's position. Okay, this is, this is the mimetic mode. The entire novella, Benito Sereno, is designed to stage this encounter, which affords a glimpse of the force field, seen and unseen, in which Melville has positioned the narrator of Benito Sereno. Of all such moments that stage the encounter, marking a work of prose narrative as realism, my favorite provides the turning point of this novella. And, and I mean, I thought it was absolutely marvelous the way you went from Benito Sereno uh, suddenly understanding uh, the relation, Babo's relationship to Benito and um, Emma's understanding of uh, Mr. Knightley as um, something she hadn't seen, but, and had, but actually wanted and needed to complete herself. It is at this moment that the American captain, Amasa Delano, 
turns abruptly from the enfeebled Captain Serino, Spanish captain, as if abandoning him to the care of the obsequious slave valet and caretaker Babo, a move that virtually consigns the American vessel to share the fate of the Spanish slave trader, which has been taken over by a slave insurrection. As if to complete, it's, a, it's this movement of turning away that I'm interested in. As if to complete Delano's turn by another 180 degrees, Serino leaps onto the ship at Delano, Delano's heels, attached at the hip to the valet, Babo, bearing a knife and a face twisted with his intention of slaying Delano. In the blink of an eye, this all happens kabam. With, with the blink of an eye, the scales of Western racism fall away temporarily to expose the power relations choreographing the backstory that has materialized this strange con configuration. The slave is not Serenos. Okay, this is Peter now. The slave is not or what Peter allows us to see is happening. Um, the slave is not Serino's crutch and the prosthesis of white power, as Delano assumed, but the agent of insurgent black power behind a white mask. Delano has the prosthetic and the mimetic turned around or the the um, what is prosthetic in relation to what? Where the mimetic imagination maps out what can be cognitively mapped and empirically known, Boxall explains, quote, the form of realism, this is Boxall now, the form of realism that emerges with the development of the 19th century novel can give the material of life a bound form only by bringing mind into contact with a mode of prosthetic embodiment which continually exceeds the rhetorical forms that vitalize it. You have to read that sentence. It's it, that is a really hard sentence. <laughs> As for the third move, in Boxall's argument, I came away with two possibilities. I'm uncertain about this. What it's clear to me that you're saying that. Realism is prosthetically dependent, that it requires this moment to under, of reversing the, the, the mirror and the object world or the, the, the fake news and true news or whatever uh, to become realistic. As for the third move in Boxall's argument, I came away with two possibilities, both of which as he claims, would see human understanding extend beyond itself and into the new territory he sees as something like empty sets, inanimate material, or interstitial spaces beyond the limits of the sentence. And I'd just like to footnote there that this beyond has become just intriguing or necessary to both critics and novelists. Um, as I was reading you, uh, your invocation of the of the beyond or the interstitial or the the uh, some dead spaces, I couldn't help but thinking of the end of every cozy novel, which ends sort of confronting that horizon. The slow man, Elizabeth Costello, uh, Michael Kay, so on and so, and a couple of the Jesus novels. Um, let's see. These spaces seem to place great faith on the human or rely on the human imagination. They promise, if nothing else, that the prosthetic imagination has not yet met its limit. In a fascinating exchange with Don DeLillo near the end of his book, Peter asked the author, what he thought his 2016 novel, Zero K, suggested about the future, the future both of prose fiction and of a technologized and ecologically destitute life world. 
That's a quotation from DeLillo's response, or, or maybe your question, from Peter's question. DeLillo responds with a predict prediction that new communication technology, together with the fact of a dying planet, will, quote, summon a new kind of novel with a language that alters our perceptions, unquote. What does this mean? Is Boxall assuring us via DeLillo that novels will continue to reimagine the material world as one that potentially belongs to us? Okay, this is the gesture that Locke began. Inversely, is he suggesting that novels will imagine a world that asks us to reverse the relation of that a priori individual we call the reader, and by doing so, help us become something else, another kind of individual, perhaps, with a different relation to the world. If we have always been prosthetic extensions of the novels we read, and I would argue that case, this should not mean that we become other than human. Okay, we don't, I mean, I think, as, as Donna Haraway suggested, you know, science fiction, use science fiction to tell us that. Um, as we make the, you know, we, we do not, need to become other than human if we make, even as we make the world unfit to live in. It's more a matter of recognizing that nothing human is natural. And that is probably the definition of human that I came away from book with. That our technology, prob that on our technology probably rests the power to change what is not yet ourselves for the better rather than for the worse. That's it. That's the best I could do with your, your very poetic ending and the deep sea. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you, everyone. Um, I'm a bit befogged uh, by, by that, but I'm going to do my best to respond quickly. But I'm, I'm going to, with an eye on the time as well, I'm going to break the flow of these, these discussions just quickly to say some thanks. Um, Firstly, to thank everyone for coming. I can't see any of you, but I, I trust the technology to to uh, be convinced that you're there. Um, it's great to see see people here. It's also uh, great that so many people have dedicated their time to this. I want to thank Holly Hopkins for setting it up, who we'll see at the end. Um, I want quickly to thank my family. Uh, I think they're here. I think my my children are here, and I want to thank them for putting up with me wittering on about prosthetics for the last half decade at least. Uh, my son, I think, uh, became very used to telling me, Dad, there's nothing prosthetic about that. Um, <laughs> and I, I thought him that some things are prosthetic that you didn't think were before. Um, so thanks to them and um, mostly to my uh, partner, Hannah, who, as Ray said, is the dedicatee of the book. She's also the reader I have in my head and also my my co-thinker and I don't think there's a single thought in this book that we haven't in some sense shared so thank you to her. Uh, I don't want this to be an Oscar acceptance speech but I also want to thank Ray um, who's gone away I mean he's here somewhere but he's, he's uh, disappeared. Everyone who knows Ray knows what an incredible intellectual energy he brings to his role and to everything that he does. Um, Having Ray behind a book that you're writing is like having that book injected with amphetamines, as we all know who have worked. Um, and it wouldn't be possible to have written that book without without him and his syringe. So thank you, Ray. Um, and lastly, a thanks just for all of you uh, on the panel coming and dedicating your time, giving your time to reading my book. I'm, I'm moved and uh, I'll be thinking about what you've all said for. Uh, for a long time to come, so thank you. Um, my own thoughts, I'm just gonna start by reflecting a bit on the title that we've collectively given to this discussion, uh, A History of the Novel, uh, uh, sorry, that's not the title. The title is The Artificial Life of the Novel. That's the title of this panel, The Artificial Life of the Novel, um, which is in part a, a, an echo of the subtitle of the book, if you can see that, um, A History of the Novel as Artificial Life. Um, it's also, in my mind at least, intended as an echo uh, 
of or an antidote to the much vaunted death of the novel. Not the death of the old novel, but the artificial life of the novel is what I think we've been talking about today. Um, it's a very familiar refrain in our time to claim that the novel is a dying art form, that it's lost its ascendancy or its relevance. Partly, I think this is because it seems to many of us that we no longer have the attention span to read novels, um, to dedicate our time to reading such extended pieces of work. Digital media have fried our brains, this argument goes, so we no longer have the patience to sit for uninterrupted hours reading books. But it's also been argued that more profoundly, perhaps the changes brought about by our artificial electronic environments, the uh, artificial worlds in which we all live, have given rise to a more profound transformation in the structure of subjectivity itself, a transformation which weakens the purchase of the novel on our collective imaginative life. Um, We've mentioned a few times uh, Ian Watts' uh, book, The Rise of the Novel. And in that book, he famously argued that the novel as a form developed or evolved in order to give expression to the species of individualism that emerged as a result of 18th century capitalism. The history of the novel, as what uh, tells it, is conjoined with the history of individualism. But the argument might go the period we're entering into now is one in which the ascendancy of the autonomous individual enclosed in its own privately imagined world has suddenly and dramatically lapsed. As capital is distributed in new ways, so the nature of our imagined communities is transformed. Our inescapable technological connection to each other by email, by WhatsApp, by Zoom, or by go to webinar, is that what we're on? I think that's what it's called. Um, has produced a different distribution of social consciousness, one which is better expressed in forms other than the novel. That's maybe a, a kind of encapsulation of the death of the novel argument. Um, perhaps that's too in part what we mean here by the artificial life of the novel. The death of the novel might in some sense be identical with its artificial life. As we're adapting to existence in these new artificial life worlds and in these little boxes that we appear to each other as, apart from Atto, who's just a blank today, um, contemporary prose fiction can appear only to enact the flimsy afterlife of the novel, a vestigial living on, as if the, the novel is now existing on <coughs> Um And if I don't know if any of us have read uh, Dillolo's new novel, The Silence, but that might be a perfect example of a novel that seems to be on life support me. Um, and there is obviously some kind of truth or purchase to this argument, to this kind of death of the novel argument. But what I want to do here and with all of my uh, prior panellists echoing in our minds is to sketch a kind of counter argument um, that bears on this question of the artificial life of the novel. And that is perhaps the argument that runs through the prosthetic imagination. And this counter argument, as I'm going to sketch it here very quickly, is based on two related propositions. The first is to suggest or to point out that the novel as a form has always been dying. It's not just dying now, it's been dying from the very beginning. As Cervantes' Don Quixote puts it, at one of the originating moments of the novel imagination, living, I die. Don Quixote says, living in the novel is dying. And Cervantes profoundly knows that. Ian Watts' characterization of the novel as a form perfectly fitted to the emergence of a capitalist individualism was from the beginning to this extent partly mistaken. And Nancy, I think, has written uh, on this at length in various places. Throughout its history, critics and readers of the novel, as well as novelists themselves, have expressed an intuitive sense that there's something deathly, something unfitting about the novel as a form that makes it always precarious and always moribund. It's as if, despite its dominance as a means of giving life a narrative shape, the novel touches always on a form of death or brushes continually against its own expressive limits. Now, there are many possible reasons for this, but the one that I pursue in the book uh, 
is that it's the very intimacy of the novel's contact with the mechanism of life that exposes it so relentlessly and so ruthlessly to a kind of death. The novel achieves a closer proximity than any other expressive form to the space that lies between mind and world, what I theorize in the book as a prosthetic region uh, between thought and thing, between information and material. The novel dwells in this region, and so it witnesses both the ways in which mind brings matter to life and the ways in which dead matter continually resists the call of mind. That's the first proposition. And the second proposition is to suggest that in continually pressing against this deathly place where mind materializes itself, the novel makes a certain kind of prosthetic thinking and knowing possible, uniquely perhaps. This is in part a historical kind of knowledge. The novel, as I read it in this book, stands as an intimate archive of the changing ways in which life has been shaped by the development of prosthetic technologies throughout the history of modernity. But even as it preserves this history, the novel has always been a future-oriented form, a form that, that offers new ways of conceiving artificial life, new ways of thinking about how living material relates to non-living, how mind relates to matter. Living is a kind of dying, Don Quixote says. Life is entwined with death, as in the word that Laura used, that entwining is important. Life is entwined with death, but this is a twining which is continually productive of new forms of being, new amalgams of the animate and the inanimate. As Don Quixote says, in the very midst of his dying, death recalls me to life again. Now, it's this kind of knowing stored in the novel form as latent possibility, this life to which we are recalled by death, that constitutes the artificial life of the novel as I see it. It's evidently the case for all of us that our contemporary environments el elude the expressive forms in which we've imagined them. This is caused not only by the emergence of our new digital life world, but by the other great transformations which we all face and which many of us today have referenced. The ongoing crisis in democratic forms of governance, the biopolitical crisis ushered in by COVID-19, the long slow motion catastrophe, the climate change. These transformations make life feel artificial to us. It's perhaps one of the dominant modes of, or, or affects of contemporary life, but it feels artificial. We can't grasp it because it doesn't fit with the forms that we have with which to express it. These crises put life at odds with the forms in which we have humanized it. But this kind of just disjunction does not spell the death of the novel, but is rather the very condition of its possibility. The history of the form tells us that it is when mind is most at odds with matter that the novel produces its most radical transformations in our apparatuses for thinking and knowing. If there is a future for the novel, if there is a future for the prosthetic imagination, then it's from this shifted denatured relation between the living and the dead, between the artificial and the real, that such a future will emerge. That is where I'm going to end it. Um, thank you again to all of you. Uh, we now have a, a few, here's a, a, a question. Uh, can you say more about how the terms mimesis and prosthesis relate to one another? Um, Nancy, do you, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> How terms mimesis and prosthesis relate to one another? Um, contradictorily. Um, they, they're in contradiction. I mean, one says that, you know, there are two, two, there are two different ways of knowing. One in which is more a metonymic mode, in that, you know, the the things of the world are an extension of the self or and or vice versa. Um, it it works by, you know, by mixing yourself, your mind with things and in, in encounters, whereas mimesis is a mirroring relationship. So in Auerbach's terms, my mimesis still 
contains the idea that our expressive forms refer to a world that predates them or, um, and uh, is solid in relation to them. Um, uh, prosthesis or a prosthetic logic would be based on the on the conception that our our forms aren't referring to a world but are making that world itself. Um, could could you say that the that mimesis assumes that both you know the thinking mind and world exist a priori to their encounter? Yeah, and 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 I think I think um, I think if there's a if there's a sort of central point to my attempt to historicize the relationship between mimesis and prosthesis as I see it, um, it would be that the 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 movement across the 20th century away from mimesis uh, towards the sense that our expressive forms produce the world that they describe. That, that movement was a, was a movement to, uh, away from materiality. It might be that we associate that with some claim that the world itself is a text. Um, so and, so how, how, do you, how do you think of that? I mean, I'm thinking of that your history in some way parallels the history of mathematics and the onset of quantitative thinking in the yeah. ninth, 19th century yeah. rather than um you, you know call it the the rather than recognizing the quality of things i so i'm not sure if it's idealism versus materialism i mean you could you can call that mode of quantitative thinking um either one I mean, I, yeah, and and I I think I think I, the tendency, the late twentieth century tendency, to think that that matter disappeared under the sign. So if if we think the our expressive forms don't refer to the world, or our mathematical forms don't refer to number that's out there in the world, but create that number, that that and, form, and spatialize what is actually in motion. Yeah, and that and that and that thought form was a was a was driven by the sense that the world disappeared under under its sign systems and i think the the okay. the, the driving force behind my my opposition of prosthesis to mimesis as opposed to text um, is that is that the the prosthetic turn if we want to call it that is is driven by the recognition that material survives the disappearance of the world into its sign systems, um, and there, and you can see signs of this everywhere. That that uh, that the world hasn't gone away uh, if our mimetic forms lose their power. But it's just that it 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 re it, re it re reappears um, in very material ways. Like eco crisis is one way of seeing how the world reappears when the modes in which we humanize it fail. So, so if mimesis is giving way to prosthesis, that's because there's a new materiality that is, that's asserting itself um, as world becomes the expressive forms that we count for it with. Can I, Peter? Can I? Um, oh, the, the 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 recent um, results of the American elections mm. and the completely distinctive and opposing uh, 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 responses to the result also, sh also show that the sign system, which previously was the sign system produced by man, but mm. now the sign system produced by the machine, by the algorithms of Facebook and Twitter and so on, are producing consciousness. So it's now it's not consciousness that is producing the sign system. The sign system writ large, as in the algorithms that generate enclaves. So yeah. friends and family uh, are what populate uh, your updates on Facebook or on Twitter and so on. But it has been scaled up to such a degree that there are two completely distinctive uh, uh, responses to facts and figures. So yeah. the elections have been tabulated 
The numbers are clear, but there are distinctive ways of interpreting the numbers. So that even though one says uh, Biden won 306, uh, uh, you know, electoral college votes versus uh, yeah. Trump, uh, uh, 200 and something, however many he won, they are interpreting those two completely differently. So the science system is now responsible through the algorithms of social media of producing consciousness and therefore impacting on reality. And that's uh, the reverse prosthesis. So it's not man prostheticizing the world. The, the, the algorithm has now converted man into a prosthesis of itself yeah yeah that's a that's a that's a, that's a much better way of putting it than i than i uh, managed we've got a question from nicholas royal um how do you conceive the relation between telepathy and the prosthetic imagination anthony Rowland says prosthetic memory in alison landsberg's work contains the possibility of the colonizing imagination Subjects are able to take on board and possibly erase other memories and cultures. Peter's concept of the prosthetic imagination has a much more enabling sense of going beyond impoverished subjectivity through the capacious form of the novel. Is this a fair characterization? Or is there anything we should be troubled by in the prosthetic imagination? Um, I'm sure there is. I'm going to carry on going and see, and we'll, we'll get some responses. Um, uh, Drew Milne has written, uh, thank you to everyone for engaging contrib contributions. My question is, what happens to poesis and the question of prose as opposed to poetry? Uh, that's, each time I'm asking one of these questions, I'm wanting to answer, but I'm going to carry on. Um, uh, Sarah Dillon writes, this is a question about medium specificity. I'm curious about the focus on the novel exclusively. Can these arguments be made about other stories or narratives embedded in other forms, e.g. the short story film, etc.? What are the grounds for claiming, if you wish to claim such, that only narrative in the novel form performs these operations uh, in the ways you are arguing? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Okay, fine. Um, I just, I'm interested in this question. I just got through teaching a course on transmediality. The, the novel as, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of belated medium as, as Peter spelled out in his, under the rubric of death of the novel. But in fact, the novel is in, incorporating, the novel is restaging uh, its competition with other media. And in many ways adopting what, what Otto describes as algorithmic thinking, um, the, the email or social networks as a way of producing a constellation or character field, you know, just incorporating all these technologies as part of its own narrative machinery. Yeah. And I think the novel has always been, I mean, this is why it's, it's both, you know, a, a killer machine, you know, some kind of monster and uh, something that makes life. It's a mulching machine where it takes in these other media and other genres all the time and restages them for us. So I think that's happening. I mean, I'm very interested in novels that turn into are made for serial production or like Remainder becomes a film, or uh, Saviano's Gamora, or something like that. So that's that's my shtick on it. I don't think you can talk about the that media, this media environment of ours separately. It's a hypermediated environment. I, the very you can't talk about media independently or specific specifically. Peter, I can take the question on telepathy and uh, the prosthetic, prosthetic imagination. Um, is that would that be all right? Yeah, yeah, that's Nick Royal's question. Uh, hello, Nick. Um, so, I mean, I think that that really uh, 
in a way encapsulates what I was trying to do with uh, Keats's This Living Hand, a poem that he writes in 1819, and then he of course dies two years later. And the poem is not read until 1838. You know, this great poem about the anxiety of posthumous reception is not even read in his lifetime. And, you know, and, and what he's stretching out is not poetry, but this living hands, you know, obviously it's, you know, this is a sort, of, sort, of, sort of very, uh, the kind of pulpy base of horror, you know, when, Parts are not parts of holes, you know, this fragment poem, which is not part of his published corpus or published oeuvre, you know, and there is there is sort of telepathy in the sense that it is playing with distance and nearness and proximity. Um, I mean, what what I did with that distance from reading your book and, and uh, is also, you know, think about the Victorian Gothic in a very interesting way. You know, I mean, I, I thought what you were doing, for instance, in uh, chapter five, the strange, the strange affinity chapter uh, with the Victorian Gothic. Um, that in a way, I mean, you hadn't quite mentioned the reader, but your book enabled me to think about the prosthetic reader. And I was thinking about Dracula along the lines of, you know, distance and nearness. You know, Mina Harker, Jonathan Harker. I mean, they're oops, they're doing product placement all the time. Kodak, Kodak camera, phonograph. You know, um, sort of. You know, the, the when Dracula is running away, they're using sort of submarine technology. So they, they're they're excited about that, not realizing that the the narrator itself has become a machine, has become one of the very sort of information technologies through which the novel is trying to capture its object. So. Yeah. This idea of like distance and nearness, I think, is collapsed in the prosthetic imagination. And it it's not just about death and life in the novel. It's also about a certain death and life that the reader has to negotiate in relation to the death and life in the novel. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's absolutely right. And, and um, it is, in, in a sense, uh, I think I, I wish he was here to tell me whether this is right. But I think in a sense, what you've said is the is an answer to Tim Bue's question, which has just come in, which is uh, I want to ask uh, Peter, I want you to ask whether in your conception, mind itself is better understood as a prosthesis, which is perhaps to say, does the prosthesis lie at the origin of the subject? Um, I think I think uh, Anki has kind of answered that question. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to get to the bottom of this list and then we'll see if we can wrap things up. Um, Sophie Baluli has said in 21st century fiction, you argue that I argue that there is a quote persistent fascination with the shifted temporality that characterizes the new century with a time that passes in a way that we can't quite capture that eludes our narrative grasp. Can you explain how the prosthetic imagination relates to this new temporality in 21st century novels, please? Um, uh, I think Atto's comments in a sense address that. Um, uh, we could perhaps come back to it, though, and try and tease it out a bit more in the very few minutes we have left. Um, Lindsay Stonebridge has written to say, uh, my question, that was an amazing panel, she says, my question is, where is value? Or maybe, because Kant is obviously also a dead hand this evening, judgment. <laughs> um, that's a great question, Lindsay. Uh, what about bad prosthesis? Um, Juna Moore has said, do you see utopian potential in the prosthetic imagination um I, yes um uh, but we could discuss that um uh, uh sarah J john keary has said uh, nice to see you uh, could you possibly elaborate a bit on the question of artifice or the artificial and how this is related to eco crisis um which is a fascinating question and elica burma who's the last question we'll have, um, says, thank you for the fascinating discussion, Peter and Panna. How does the interesting concept of the prosthetic Im imagination link up with the ideas of embodied thought or the distributed mind? Novels activated by readers doing our thinking for us. Um, I don't know whether any of us want to take any of those questions. Atta, I don't know whether you want to, to talk about uh Time. Well, time um, I was recently just, I think, the last week teaching um, Kutsia and uh, waiting for the barbarians. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the magistrate is in the first person, the entire narrative is in the first person, it's his, his mind. He's sharing with us his observations and 
However, one fascinating thing of this mode of writing is the, or narration is that the uh, magistrate always speaks as though he's reading. That is to say, his speech forms are all textual. But in fact, th this, this uh, premise, which is commonplace in almost all of uh, Kutsia's characters, actually there are individuals in the world who think as though they were, they are reading. And it is because they've read so much that their minds have been textualized. And so you meet people who, when they open their mouths, it's like they're reading or producing a text. I mean, many, uh, many of us academics think like that, especially to ordinary mortals, because we, we, we've read, absorbed so much writing that we think as though we are reading. But more significantly, how did the high modernist, you know, Wolf and uh, uh, Joyce manage to capture the flow of reverie so well you know, the, the flow of reverie and internal monologue so well that people think as though they were reading Joyce. But a more worrying extension of that, that the book produces how we think, is that the internet and social media, people think as though they were completely entangled in a social media world. And so the, the geometric points of thought are all social mediatic. Our children are in danger of completely being absorbed in this social mediatic forms of thinking. And you see it when they are talking, the, the speed at which they skip from thing to thing, completely unrelated. <laughs> but, but that's how the hypertextuality of, uh, of social media works. So these are all instances in which the book and the science system have uh, produced us so that the prosthesis, and I'm repeating myself here, the prosthesis is not as man or woman producing the world, but the science system out there dematerializing us. And so we think and talk as though we are talking book, book talk. <laughs> I mean, it, this, this might take us to, as the final uh, thought um, to Lindsay Stonebridge's question. Um, uh, Kant is obviously a dead hand this evening. What about judgment? What about bad prosthesis? And I take it, I take her to mean that um, there is an aesthetic judgment we make, we may make where something is simply dead, um, dead because it hasn't had life imparted to it, and we might judge that it's a failure as a result. Um, uh, what, I, about, I, what about what about prosthesis? I mean, I think that many prostheses are harmful. But I mean, I, I consider the possessive individualism itself, you know, the, and all the texts that taught us to imagine ourselves that way, as is in, in some ways reaping a bitter harvest now. Yeah. yeah. I, if I can jump in, I mean, I think that is why. Um, what I really valued about um, this new history of the novel that you offered, Peter, is that there's always something that's working against that um, absorption into the self, right? I mean, it's there, but there's always um, something else, something that exceeds, um, as I was trying to get at in my comments. And I mean, I think that is precisely what we need today and why um, I think you end um, talking about sort of environmentalism um, more than human subjects is what I would want to say. I don't know if you would want to, to extend subjectivity beyond the human, I would. But that there's a way, and, and there's a way in which the novel, and I think this also goes to the comment about it um, remediating other forms, is um, working against that algorithmic logic, I would suggest. Because even as some of the novels I found most interesting to read recently, such as Red Pill, or Ben Lerner's Topeka School, um, or Ruman Alam's Leave the World Behind, even as they're like mediating um, ways in which our minds are inculcated into these media bubbles by other media, they're also bringing um, a variety of these um, isolated individualistic spaces into, into collision with one another in the space of the novel. 
And so while the characters might not always sort of see the shared um, external world that is bringing all these things into one, um, I into a single world, even as they perhaps subjectively experience it as isolated, the novel itself is doing that work for us. And I think working then against this kind of algorithmic subjectivity. Or that's my my utopian hope for the novel, anyway. Yeah, well, that answers the question: Is there a utopian uh, element to the process? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's been an absolutely fascinating ninety minutes. I'm a hundred percent sure that the headline on the Daily Mail tomorrow will be that Boxall says all that is mimetic melts into the prosthetic, with some <laughs> juicy quotes from close friends of the family. But um, the conversation, the dialogue, um, and some br really brilliant questions shows that the debate is much more complex and enduring than that, and it's um, going to run on for some time. Um, let me assure you that the book makes ideal summer reading, the perfect Christmas gift, and no home should be without it. <laughs> and as well as the marketing drive, uh, marketing campaign goes into overdrive. I just, on behalf of CUP and for me personally, want to thank everybody who's made tonight possible. It's been absolutely uh, fantastic. That's the panelists who've uh, given up a lot of their time to everybody uh, listening in, but most of all to Peter and his family, you know, who've made this event possible. Um, we all know that writing a book is an enormous emotional investment. Um, over the last four years, that's been more than ever before, maybe. But it's a delight to be back in the Republic of Letters after all that we've uh, gone through. And on behalf of the 150 or so people who are, who are listening in, I'd ask the panelists to uh, help me embarrass Peter with a round of applause for all that he's done. Well done, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody.